Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I am the manager of public programs and outreach at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome back to all of you who we've seen many times before for previous programs. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of the trolley era and our collection that you can experience from home, typically on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. And we're gonna continue these regularly as long as we have presenters. So if you have a show that you would like to share that fits our museum mission, let me know. Uh, that would be anything about Pennsylvania, the trolley era, cities where our streetcars come from. Next month, we have a Frank Sprague biogra biography presentation. So that'll be neat. If you have something that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, uh, please reach out anyway, and we'll see what we can do. We have a full list of upcoming programs on our website at patrolley.org, which I will share in the chat box in just a couple of minutes so you can click on it. And I wanna extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program, or if you've made donations through our website this year. We really, really appreciate your support, especially, oh gosh, we've been doing these for more than three years now. So thank you very, very much. Um, we'll go through this really quickly since most of you have been to these before. We were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened to visitors a few years later in 1963. We're actually located along the route between, um, or the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington that was sadly discontinued um, in 1953. And you'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate here at the museum. And we've got about 30,000 visitors per year taking the four mile scenic ride. Uh, and I want to give some brief updates. If you haven't been around the museum in a while, we have doors on our new Welcome and Education Center. This is the Volunteer Boulevard, so Volunteer Boulevard side of the building. And you can see uh, we've got some new glass doors there. We're very excited. Everything is moving along. We are on target to open this building later this year. Um, you can always help support our capital campaign and other projects at the museum at patrolley.org slash support. I'll share that at the end as well. Just a couple other things going on. On the left, you'll see a picture of Keith Bray there. Some of you may know him from his work at other museums as well with some doors for uh, both the Freight Motor 07 and um, the Mon West Pen Car 274. So uh, he brought those with him on his most recent visit. And on the right side, this is kind of a behind the scenes photo inside of our Reliance building, which is over 60,000 square feet of space. And uh, we got some new pallet racks to store lots and lots of things. Um, I just read from our facilities director report that all of the trucks that we had stored outside are now inside, which is very exciting. Um, and then lastly, see if these videos are playing. The Terrible Trolley, oh, I don't think they're playing. Projects are moving along. <laughs> In the top left, you'll see Jack Jost. He is 17 years old. He's our project manager on the Terrible Trolley restoration project. So eventually you'll see it in that paint scheme on the right with the black and the yellow Steelers. Um, we're working with them to um, get the project done. And you'll see the step wells need some major work. So that's coming up soon before we can repaint the car and put the floor back in. So it's missing its floor right now. <laughs> okay. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter for our Where the Heck is Hecla program, Dennis Kramer. Dennis Kramer has volunteered at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum for 29 years in both the operations and publications departments. And he is now a retired educator, but a lifelong teacher and mentor. <laughs> and at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with Dennis, but the chat box will be open throughout the program. So feel free to type comments or questions in there and we will get through those at the end. And just to note, this program is being recorded and will be shared to YouTube within the next month or so. So keep your microphones muted. And at this time we will turn our videos off and I will invite everybody to turn those on again at the end. All right, Dennis, if you are ready, take it away. All right, let's see.
We should be ready to go. I assume everyone can see my screen. Yes, we are all moving. Right. We're, we're moving through the slides already. Was that supposed to happen? All right, there we are. Okay, great. So, welcome to where the heck is Hecla? Uh, we're going to take a small look at part of West Penn Railways. I don't have a a. Uh, there's actually too much material to cover in one time, so we're going to break this apart. Uh, we'll take a look at everything that goes the other side of Greensburg towards. Trafford and McKeesport at another time. So why in the world did anyone build a streetcar line out in the middle of nowhere? And if you look at the two numbers at the bottom of these two maps, you kind of see why. In the Connorsville Coke region, which is the western slope of Laurel Mountain, in 1880, their population was 78,000 in Westmoreland County. 40 years later, it tripled. The same thing happened in Fayette County. What happened? They found coal that turned into a wonderful product called Coke, and they moved it right to Pittsburgh, and they made steel. And it was the golden age of steel in this country. Coke ovens equaled jobs. There were lots and lots of subsidiary jobs, not just the people that worked in the mine, but virtually everything that they used the timber they used in the mines, the machinery that they used was all made locally. It was amazing. And West Penn was built to help accommodate this. Uh, you can you can see, uh, we'll start up here. Can, I'm assuming you can all see my pointer up here in Greensburg. And originally there were two lines that came down to Scottdale. Scottdale is where the line crosses into Everston. That's Fayette County down there. We'll look at that some other time also. This was known as the Hunker Line or the Back Line. The main line came down and went through Southwest, down through Mount Pleasant, and down to Scottdale. There was a local line in Latrobe that West Penn Railways had owned and controlled for a long time, and it made its way the whole way down to about Bagley, but there was nothing between Bagley and Southwest. But we'll see why and how that ended up getting built. In Greensburg, the first system was Greensfield and Hempfield, and it was organized around 1889 and 1890, which is like everywhere else that was starting to have electric traction in their cities. We're, we're all looking about the same time period there. As I said, Greensburg changed a lot. The map on the left shows all of the trackage that originally existed with all kinds of neat little routes to go around town and et cetera, et cetera. And this wonderful little route that goes up this way that eventually goes to Jeanette and Irwin and Trafford. And this was the line that came down, the Hunker Line. And on the other side of the Pennsylvania Railroad, we cross and we come down through South Greensburg. By 1937, all of that extra trackage was gone, including down here, the bottom part of the Hunker Line. It, it just, just they, the only reason they kept it this far was this is where the car house was. So here we are in Greensburg. Uh, back in 1952, they knew that things were coming to an end. This was the day after the uh, final day of service. And we see the cars leaving the turnbuckle and heading up Main Street. And I've been back to Greensburg a couple of times. And you can see the view really kind of looks the same. The terminal is still there. The only thing that you, you won't find is on the far side of the terminal over here, the bank has built an addition to it, or the, the city hall rather, excuse me, next, next door to the city hall was the bank where the gas station used to be. Uh, the little round picture down here is looking the opposite way in Greensburg. So let's take a little trip from Greensburg to Hecla. Now you wonder, well, where's Hecla? Because Hecla didn't show up on the map. We'll find out why. Uh, the Palace Theater, virtually all the cars that left or came into Greensburg took a trip around the city before they went into the terminal and then left to head south. And we're going to be going, we're going to be leaving the terminal up here and we're going to be coming down and crossing under the railroad and heading down into South Greensburg. 
but for now we're still in town. The two pictures on the left show Main and Ottoman streets, obviously at very different time periods. And the two pictures on the right show Pennsylvania Avenue at 4th Street. That's the bottom picture is term, turning into the terminal. And this is a little farther out of town. This is South Main Street at Euclid Avenue. The streetcars came down and made a very quick turn to the left to go out Mount Pleasant Street. Obviously, it seems like every time I go to Greensburg, there's something new in this portion of South Main Street. I'm not sure quite what goes on with that property. So here we are now crossing over into South Green, Southwest Greensburg and nothing here looks the same at all. On the left, we see a couple of street cars heading out Mount Pleasant Street, and that's the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge over there. Well, down here, you can kind of see the bridge in the distance, and all of this has just been completely wiped out and changed. Now we're a little farther out of South Greensburg, and we're now down at the end of Broad Street, and we're looking towards Youngwood. And in the bottom picture, you see that I took that last Saturday, uh, looking the same way. You can still see the pole lines going out. That's headed out towards Sandhouse Siding. And once you drive down 119, everyone takes the picture of the sign that says Trolley Line Avenue. And then you go over and it says Trolley Line Avenue trail access, which is fine, but the trail isn't on the streetcar line, it's on the railroad line. A little farther down, we head towards Armbrust and, sorry about that. We head back to Armbrust and cross over the creek. And if you look very carefully when you drive in through this area, you can actually snap a picture down there in the left-hand corner over here, this neat little thing right here. That's one of the stone supports that are still there from the trestle. Thanks to Kyle McGrogan for saying that might still be there. So let's go for a ride. And what you're seeing on the left is a map. And the arrow is kind of pointing where we are. We're, we're going up Main Street. We just saw that in the in the photographs. And now we're coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. The arrow has changed. We're heading towards the terminal. And the photographs I showed you, I said it was coming pretty close to the terminal. That's where the curve is in the street. And you see on the side window, he's headed to Uniontown. But he's going to pull in behind the bus. This section of the terminal was completely gone. This is looking up Main Street. And now we're on Mount Pleasant Street. The photographer is actually standing up on the top of the railroad trestle. Everything on the right-hand side is all gone. The feed bill, all of that has completely disappeared. This is fun. This is typical West Penn. He's in the inbound lane, and the car coming up as a direction has to go into the outbound lane to try to get around him. Now we're going to leave South Greensburg and head out into the wild blue yonders of Sandhouse Siding. And the photographer liked it so much, he decided to stay there and watch a car coming back into town. A ride over Armbrust Trestle. And you'll notice if you look at the map, the arrow is pointing to the little guy. There's a trail there, but it's going to come across and it's going to come down. We'll, we'll see it in a second and cross the road, uh, State Route 819. And it's really kind of, it's all, everything is still there except the tracks, but it looks very different. So we're gonna come down here because you're coming off of a hill. It's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty good hillside right there. And you're coming down and this is PA 819. The house on the left is still there, but there are a lot of trees and everything else have grown up around this now. Strickler siding, West Penn planned their sidings very, carefully so that they could make rolling meets. You can see they're just it's big enough for two cars to pass, one car to pass each other. 
and keep moving right along. The motorman, I'm sure, took great pride in being able to do such things. This is still Strickler siding. The rural territory, it is, it's, it's very pretty if you go the right time of the year. Um, with the mountain right, Laurel Mountain right up beside you. But we've gotten to Hecla, which is actually called Southwest. Now, why is Southwest called Hecla? They built the mines, they called it Hecla One, and then they built Hecla Two, which is actually in the town of Trauger, and then Hecla Three mine was opened in Hecla again. But when they went to apply for a post office, the town of Hecla is actually in Schuylkill County in eastern Pennsylvania, so they couldn't call it Hecla, so it's southwest. We see we're, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here right now because we're taking the main line down to Scottsdale. But we see a car coming in to Hecla. The company store is down over the hill, and the scene is kind of the house is still there. If you look at the picture down on the right, I was down there again on, on Saturday. The house still exists, and but we're, we're going to move on for now because we're going to make our way from where it says southwest over here. We're going to make our way down to Mount Pleasant and then down to Scottsdale. And then we'll take a ride up the back line back to Greensburg. So we're talking about distances. It's only 10 miles from Heckler to Scottsdale, and it's only 19 from Greensburg to Scottsdale. So we're not talking tremendous differences, distances here. The first major thing everybody wants to talk about is the turnpike. And so where do you cross your 80.3, milepost 80.3? You can't really see anything anymore, but it's it's still neat to know that the turnpike had to get permission to cross the trolley line because the trolley line was there first. And so this photo shows one of the work cars and a passenger car while they're completing the line over top. I mentioned about how how beautiful it can look on the left. If you look very closely, that's the crossing over top of the turnpike. And then just a little farther south is Trout's Crossing. And a clear, the photographers had beautiful days. Not so much here, not so much here. Uh, this is the standard works. It was probably the largest Coke works in the in the world at one time. And it's where State Road approaches 819. And you can see, uh, well, you can't see because where the Coke ovens and that huge gob pile is, is basically the picture in the upper right-hand corner now. That has all been completely changed. A railroad trestle has been put over top of the intersection where the automobile is headed to uh, it. It's kind of an amazing transformation, and it does show that we were able to reclaim some of it. The big problem, speaking with some locals down there, is everybody has mine subsidence insurance because everything is outgrown. So we're now down to Mount Pleasant and the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club took their final tour on August 10th in car 739 and 732. And you see on the right, the hotel is gone. And because the hotel is gone, we can now actually see the beautiful home that was hidden behind it all those years across the street. This is looking the other direction. Obviously, we still see the hotel is gone. And you can see up where the Firehouse is up here. That's where I stood that took the picture on the previous page looking back down. Iron Bridge siding. There is part of a trail there, and it's very easy to get confused because there were three different railroads right at Iron Bridge. The Iron Bridge crossed over the Pennsylvania Railroad. There was a car house there and a power station. The car house is still there. You can see it up behind the power station. And there is part of the trail. But as you came down onto Iron Bridge, you crossed over the Pensy, but you came down alongside the B&O. 
So we're leaving Southwest, we're leaving Hecla, we're headed towards the Turnpike. That's green siding, it's just before the Turnpike. And here we go, up over the turnpike. And we're almost down to the road over there on the left-hand side of the map. That was so much fun. We're gonna go down below and watch it go over top the turnpike. By the way, there were no guardrails or anything between the lanes and the turnpike. This is, we're coming into Mount Pleasant. And this car is actually leaving Mount Pleasant headed towards Greensburg. And there's the inbound, the southbound car. This is still outside of Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant was one of the three major towns, Mount Ple Greensburg, Mount Pleasant, and Scottsdale in Westmoreland County that were served by West Penn Railways. And the photographer's kind of standing up where I was standing as he's taking that shot. The car's headed towards Uniontown. It's headed towards Scottsdale. my map is wrong don't look at my map i ran out of time here we're crossing over the pensy and we come down and to the left is the bno and that's the track that's still there that's run by norfolk southern or excuse me yeah not norfolk that's um the small railroad group that's down there in scottdale And now we're going to take another look going over I can't imagine what it was like riding up over these and looking down it had it had to be quite a um, a unique experience to say the least I'm sure the operators really didn't want to have to worry about losing their poles up there And another shot. This particular shot up to me almost looks like a model. It's everything is so exposed. And so now we move on to Swede Town Siding, which is just outside of scottdale and the picture this picture these houses in the distance these are these houses up here it's on mount pleasant road coming out of scottdale and so we come into scottdale scottdale was the company headquarters of the henry henry clay frick coal and coke company which completely dominated the connellsville Coal field. I just love this picture. People went everywhere by streetcars. Uh, there was a there was a, a very large cast iron pipe foundry in Scottsdale, and their safety organization had a big get together. So they brought the, they brought the company band along with them. Now we're seeing the end of Scottsdale, where we're crossing the bridge over into Everson. That bridge is obviously has been replaced. And there again, notice. Imagine trying to navigate this with an automobile and that 59 foot long streetcar. So I'm gonna take a little ride. This is a Swede Town siding. And this is leaving Scottsdale, headed for Swede Town. This is the same image that was in the photograph a little bit ago when we get to about there and you can see the houses in the distance. And then this is coming onto the Scottsdale Bridge. 
the line there was a line that continued on strength that went up to the American tin plate meadow mill, but that had been closed, but it helped serve as local service for some of the people living in Scottsdale. You can see it on the map. It continues over and then turns and when a meadow mill was up on top of the hill. Now we're at Scottsdale, we're gonna go back to Greensburg and it's actually shorter this way and faster, but because it was put out in 1937, there aren't a lot of photographs readily available at this point. And so I drove along and when you go to South, drive in between South Moreland High School, if you look over to the right, down where the football field is, that's where the line looked through. Tars siding, Tars was a line that went from Mount Pleasant to Tars, and that served as kind of local traffic, local service for the people that lived in Mount Pleasant. So it was, it was convenient, but eventually that ran, ran out of the way. Uh, the highway, this, the streetcar crossed about just above, you see a railroad crossing sign here, the streetcar crossed just about right in here in Roughsdale, and then in Hunker, it went underneath the railroad path, underpass, and there was the siding was just on the other side of there. There were a couple of different accidents there at different times. New Stanton, we, we don't see pictures of the trolleys and the turnpike with New Stanton, because by the time the turnpike opened, the trolley line underneath of it had been dormant for over a year. And so the, it, the turnpike actually crossed West Penn Railways in three places. Uh, the third place was in Irwin, and we'll see that the next time we get back to that portion. So we've made it back up to Southwest Greenberg, Greensburg, and that's where the Huff Barn was. Uh, they kept cars there. It was a convenient place to store things. Uh, there was a car, there was a, a barn at Iron Bridge, and there was a barn in Connellsville, obviously, so they, they had lots and lots of room. So we've gone back to Greensburg. There's no way by streetcar to go directly from Greensburg to La Trobe. Why? There's nothing there. The Pennsylvania Railroad was already covering that because the, the commuter trains going to Pittsburgh started at Derry, which was just beyond, just east of La Trobe. And this was the last portion of West Penn Railways that was built. As I said earlier, I mentioned earlier, we come from La Trobe, they come down to Bagley, which is about in here. And that was one portion of the line. And there was none of this was here at all in the middle. Now it's very interesting. The Pennsylvania Railroad came from Greensburg and came into this portion, the lower portion of this map. The Pennsylvania Railroad came in from La Trobe and serviced this portion of the map, but they never met in here. In 1912, they decided they were going, 1914, excuse me, they decided they were going to eliminate all of their passenger service and all these little branch lines. Why? Because in 1914, they finally finished the trolley line and it was actually it was a win for the trolley line. It was a win for the railroad because the railroad was losing money. And it was definitely a win for all of the folks that lived in this area. The Latrobe Car House, part of it is still there. Um, it's on Ligonier Street between Oak and 33rd. And when we were there in 2012, there's still track inside the building. And there's still track there outside the building today. I didn't wander in again, but it's not long for this world. Here we see Miss Cheswick. They tried using the uh, Allegheny Valley cars from Latrobe to Hecla. They never, as far as I, 840 is the only one I've seen pictures of. So we come a little farther up Ligonier Street and 
we see down on the left, we see passengers boarding, they're headed south. And, and then we see the same view on the other side. This is Ligonier Street and Latrobe. Uh, Latrobe was a major shopping center for a lot of folk. Ligonier Street went down past the mill. It turned right and there was young, there was a siding and then it crosses the creek. It goes over through the woods and it comes out happily enough on Youngstown siding or West Penn Avenue rather, excuse me. And came out and went down the highway and crossed Lincoln Highway on its way down to Bagley. And we get to Bagley and it's, oh my soul to the company store, it's still there. You can barely see the trolley here in this picture. This is the company store right in here. Here's the trolley, the line came around this way and it went up this hill. There's a bunch of unused Coke ovens back in the back, the industry left early. What was it like to live in a coal patch? It was hard. It was hard. These people had a tough life. Imagine being dirtier than you've ever been in your life and then being twice as dirty after working in the mine all day or working in the Coke ovens, coming back. You don't have running water in your house. Your wife has prepared the bathtub probably in either the living room or the kitchen, probably the kitchen, and has put hot water in, and then you're gonna bathe, they get cleaned up. You can't, I worked there. You can't get that dirt off of you that easily. Uh, they grew vegetable gardens. They were very proud of everything they did. Yes, they, it was a filthy, dirty job. The smoke was horrendous. The pollution was unbelievable, but the people were very strong-willed and it's always interesting. You, you look at the pictures you see anytime that you see any of these pictures, they're dressed up. The next town down is Whitney. Whitney has a company store also. You wonder who owns all of these company stores. At Whitney, you can still see the concrete pedestals for part of the trestle over there on the left. Uh, and they're still there. I was, even though that picture's from 2012, that was a better shot than I took when I was there not long ago. And so now we're going to go for another little ride. This is we're in Latrobe and the car is approaching the car barn. So that's the railroad way up there in the distance going over top. It's interesting in both Latrobe and Greensburg, the trolley lines were within a block of the Pennsylvania Railroad stations. And so obviously it was a very easy way to make your way back. We're now leaving the car barn and we see Latrobe, Latrobe's favorite product Rolling Rock beer sign over there in the distance. If you want to find the car barn, go down to where the brewery used to be. The photographer is now standing on the railroad overpass as we cross Main Street. This is heading south. Ligonier Street goes for almost a mile straight down before you turn to cross over the Loyal Hannah Creek. And here we're at the end of Ligonier Street and we're gonna turn into Kingston Siding. It looks like there's a lot more there than there's really there. There's not a lot of room in here. This is Kingston Siding and then we're going to go right over and cross the bridge. And we come into Youngstown Siding, which was the West Penn Avenue show street that I showed you a minute ago, he'll come out and head right down into Youngstown. This guy seemed to be having a good time. This is Bagley. It was coming down that long hill. If you're one of those of the signal systems West Penn used, it was a very simple system that lit a series of light bulbs that would show that you were clear to enter the next block. This is Whitney. And then we're going over the Whitney Bridge, which 
to me seems almost more like a ride at Kennywood that I, and once again, remember these cars don't have air brakes. These cars had magnetic track brakes and they had drum brakes and they basically they used resistance to stop the cars and then they held them in place finally with the hand gooseneck handbrake. This is coming out to Bell Memorial Church Road. And this is one of those terrifying places you'll see in a little bit as we go along, we'll make our way back there in a minute. So we leave that area, we go down to Pleasant Unity. Pleasant Unity now isn't necessarily as much of a cold patch. It's a little farther away from the line. And right where the trolley is crossing, I stop and turn to my left and snap to photograph this down in the left. So that was the, that's the line crossed to the middle of the field. Trauger, there's not much left in Trauger. I think there's five houses. The most impressive structure there is the Byzantine Catholic Church. The trolley line was actually behind it, not where we are here. Uh, the picture on the right, you can see the poles in the middle of the field. That's where the trolley line went through. You'll see this a little better when we get to the video. And you see a version of number two. And believe me, that's not very smoky. The next town we come to is Calumet. And the biggest problem they had in Calumet was actually figuring out where they were going to put the station stop because you can see most of Calumet went over a trestle. And this was where they put in the final tracks. Uh, we see the car arriving from Scottsdale, you know, and the cars ran through from Scottsdale to Latrobe uh, until the 1930s. Actually, the, it went from Scottsdale the whole way to Meadow Mill. And with the combination of all the different cars, you had fairly de decent service. Part of the Calumet Trestle is still there. If you look over beyond the SOAR project that was going on when we were there in 2012, you can see part, part of the trestle landing up here, and obviously you can see the embankment where it came from. Dennis, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we had a question a couple slides back from Jim Harrington. Um, what is in the black box the operator leaned out and flipped? Is it signals, switches? Oh, okay. I will go right back. Uh, it was in the video. It was in the video. Oh, okay. Those those are the signals for West Penn with he would throw it and it would light a set of signals at the next siding telling the pacing car. It, it's very similar to a Nashot signal, except that it was done manually. It's it's not it's protecting you from the front, it doesn't protect you from the rear. But that's what that's what those boxes were. They they would lean out and throw this, and West Penn used those. Uh, if you look in any of the books that the Charlie Museum has published on the either the Armstrong County book, the Allegheny Valley book, or even the West Penn book that we published years and years ago, there's there's a small insert about how the signals work and what they did. It was kind of it was this was a very basic company. They understood how to save money. And so if they could make something work, they made something work. That's what those, that's what were in those boxes. Those were the signal boxes. So now we're here at Hearst School and Norvelt. And this is kind of an interesting area because we've seen coal patch after coal patch after coal patch. And it was a rough life and we know that. And we do know that there were many, many strengths. And let's face it, when you lived in a coal patch, the company owned your house and you paid rent. And if you went on strike, you lost your home. And so part of the New Deal, they decided to create this place called Westmoreland Homestead, which is between, basically it's between Hecla and Calumet. And they came up on top of the hill and you can see they built 250 homes and a wonderful community environment. It's still there. And it was for unemployed workers and their families during the depression, either because they lost their jobs, the mines were done. 
the mines were done in the 20s. Every once in a while, there would be a resurgence, and they would come back and bring some coal to some of the Coke, Coke ovens, but the, the mines were all shot. So these people needed some help. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, was very, very interested. She visited here several times, and they renamed Westmoreland Homesteads in her honor in 1937. And there was also, there was a similar community built down in West Virginia. So we've arrived at Hecla. Uh, you can see the school in the distance. There's a trestle uh, that's, we're headed. The two cars in the left are sitting at the Y. Uh, the, the tracks in front of them go to the trestle, and that's what goes back towards La Trobe. And pair, where they're kind of pointing to is where the main line is. Here we see the main, we're looking the other direction now, we see the main line. I thought these photos were interesting because we see the freight motors there in 1939. We see one of the Allegheny Valley cars is there in 1939. Um, that little truck, the van sitting here, we're going to see in another picture very, very shortly. That was from the Union Supply Company. But let's go on a little farther. You can, you can, see, you can see the 800 car sitting right over here. This is kind of what some of it looks like now and then. Uh, on the left, I took the other day. Obviously, on the right, you can see the church is still there. The school is gone. The school is completely gone. And all of that area that you saw in the previous picture, if you look down to the right where my car is sitting, that's all the more area it actually took up. It's, it's amazing when you get there and you find out how did they fit all of this stuff right here. So where did the name Hecla come from? Hecla is a volcano in Southwest Iceland. And in medieval Icelandic lore, Hecla is believed to be one of the gateways to purgatory. That's a nice way of saying it. Uh, and Hecla was, there's purgatory. You don't see the smoke. Uh, the view is from, if you look at the picture down on the left, that's one of our museum fan trips from many, many moons ago. But that hill up there on the top, that's where the photographer was standing when he's looking down. You can see the bridge is over here. Let me see my cursor, you can see the bridge here. Here's the company store. And the main line came down and went through here and went along here. Almost all of this is gone today. I, I tried to find a way to get up to the hill, but I wasn't going to go walking through someone's farmer's pasture for a long time and get up there and decide there were too many trees. So I didn't do that. You can't see the coke of his Hecla number one was right over here. We'll see that in a minute with some of the other views. But you notice the nice little outbuildings and all of the fences. Fences were not designed to keep animals in. Fences were designed to keep the wild animals out of your gardens. Here we see the company's store and we see the truck. Uh, the Union Supply Company was owned by, guess who? Henry Clay Frick. He had about 22 different companies. Union Supply Company had about 22 stores. They were relatively fair as far as the prices. They weren't gouging folks constantly. Um, from everything that I've read, and I've read a good bit about in West Virginia, there's I, I have a, several different books on that describes every company town, and the Frick towns were always much nicer because uh, that's kind of where they all went after they left. the The mines played out in what Westmoreland County. The mines played out in Fayette County. They moved to Washington County and into Green County. There's still some coal there, but then they found coal in Southern West Virginia that was equal to, if not better than the Connorsville coking coal. And so obviously United States Steel went down there and bought everything they could. Uh, if you look at the picture of the store, you see right over here, there, there's a railroad crossing, the railroad crossing sign is for the streetcar line. This is the calm bank we saw earlier, and these are the ovens, they were that close to the store. I took this picture the other day. I tried to kind of put the pole in the same place. There again, you can't see anything over this way because of the tree growth. Every other, the calm bank is still there at the top. You can still see the top of it if you go to Google Maps. So 
Here we are at Bell Memorial Church Road. Now remember, these cars do not have air brakes, so they don't have whistles. They have bells. And you're gonna come out of the woods, you're gonna cross the road, and you can go back into the woods. Ding, 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 ding. Let's slow down for a second. Okay, nothing's coming, let's go. And there it goes back into the woods. Imagine coming down, driving down that road. And remember, those roads were not the roads that you see today. Even this, these films were shot in 1951. Uh, roads were pretty bad. This is Traverse Siding. Uh, the church would be kind of over the hill. There's about five houses left there. This is the highway where you saw the poles. The, in the previous picture, you saw the poles through the middle of the field. That's where this is. And we're headed towards Calumet. And then we're coming up and we're gonna go over top of Calumet Trestle. And we come into Hearst Siding, which it was called Hearst Siding. There was a school there. Hearst School was there. And the road to the right went up to Norvelt. It's like many country areas. This is one of those five point things. Those of you who live out in Delaware County understand exactly what I'm talking about. Here we are coming into Hecla. And you can see the school up there. That was the second school that was there. And we're going to see everybody's grandma coming along right here. There's in notice she's dressed. She's got her shopping bag. Now we're looking the other way. And the streetcar is coming towards Hecla. And here we are coming up from, we're passing, there was a little siding kind of where my car was parked. And we're coming up from Mount Pleasant. And the store is gone. There's just a little wealth waiting shelter now. You can see some smoke in the background. This is coming up into, this is coming from in front of the church and from the school. And now we're headed back into town, into town where the company store would be down where we saw the stop sign. So what happened? Mine's closed. You know, by 1931, all of the major mines were gone. The automobile changed things. The roads were still terrible, but the automobile changed. And buses didn't do any better. Uh, West Penn, was, they, they had some company pride. They they knew what they were doing was the right thing, but they also knew when it was time to quit. And they had planned far before that it was time to quit. It wasn't anything about television. It wasn't anything like that. They knew that things were over and they had hung on as long as they could, but it just it just didn't work. This is when the, the various, you see the Scott and the Meadow Mill section closed earliest. The lines around Greensburg all closed the lines to McKeesport, and then the last three, the the main line, the lines from Irwin to Greensburg and Latrobe to Hecla, the, it's just so sad. So what we had was on the left, the complete system from Westmoreland and into Allegheny counties. And on the right, we have what ended in 1952. So you can see that at one time there was it was very convenient. You had you had the combination of that. You also had the Pennsylvania Railroad. They were running commuter trains regularly. You had down in Scott, towards Scottsdale, the B and O was down that way, not far below that. You could go down into Connellsville and find the B and O and and the Western Maryland. Uh, these people traveled around regularly. It's it's kind of amazing uh, the system that they had. 
but they had the system because the roads and the cars were terrible. I would like to thank all the folks that helped provide images. I would especially like to thank my good friend, Ed Leibarger. Ed knows more about West Penn than anybody that I know. And I learn something new from him all the time. And it's just, I'm forever grateful that I met him 30 years ago and he's helped me along the way. All right, so now it's time for questions because that's it, Kristen. I guess I'm done sharing the yeah, I'll take over here uh, real quick. Um, okay. Yes, we are going to get to question. That was awesome. Um, actually, the the biggest note that I took during your presentation, Dennis, was OMG, Whitney Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to uh, we'll get to questions in just a minute here. But before people scatter, I did want to mention we've got the Washington County Fair coming up August twelfth to nineteenth. That'll be very exciting. If you want to see seven streetcars run at once at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum and ride streetcars, uh, like basically more than 12 hours a day, uh, come during the county fair, because that's a great time to be here. Um, we do have a couple other trolleyologies coming up, including a Frank Sprague program at the end of August. And in October, we'll have Cemetery Transit, a history of death riding the rails, which should be very interesting. And uh, let me advance here. Dennis, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also involved with this. The 2024 Pennsylvania or Western Pennsylvania trolley calendar is now available at yes, the museum store. Yes, it is. It, it's always fun. That's another of those jobs that I do with Ed and Bruce and, and Chris Walker and John Poliak in Thailand even helped us a little bit. And so it, it's always a fun project and it, it turned out great. Yes. I'm one of those people who doesn't look at the images of the month before like it is that month. So it's like spoilers for a calendar. So I haven't even looked at the photos yet and I won't get to until 2024, but everybody else can do that. I'm just weird. Um, one last thing, I wanna thank you guys for joining us. I wanna thank Dennis for presenting. Um, if you have an idea for trolleyology or if you'd enjoy giving a program, reach out to me. And thank you again to those of you who donated during the registration process for tonight's program. I'll put the link in the chat where you can support us if you like to make a donation or become a member in just a minute. So uh, let me stop the share here so we can get to some questions. Uh, and feel free to turn your videos on now too. If you um, are having problems turning your video on, let me know. Um, it might be because I turned it off earlier in the program, uh, but you're welcome to turn those on and I'll let everybody unmute in just a minute. Um, we had a lot of questions about your maps, Dennis. Uh, like, how do you do the maps? How do you make those? Can people see them? Uh, tell us more about the Google Maps. Okay, because uh, I'm, I'm looking at the chat, and so I see Mike has asked, where's the map from? Yes, I made them in Google Maps. Uh, they came from, the link right now I I have is private. I have it, I have it set in my Google Drive, but that's, that's and I can, I, I, I think I can share it because I think I shared it with Aiden Kendrick. So there is, there is a way for me to share those with you. And it, it's kind of interesting because there are, all kinds of maps out there that people have done in Google that you, that you can find. And so it it, it, it really helps. Uh, the basis of them though, years ago, my good friend Ed Leibarger took topo maps and penciled in the line and put in very specific information and he's been gathering information for virtually his entire life. And that was the basis of where I started from, so that I could follow the topo maps and follow on Google Maps. And where I got I got messed up to one point where I said in Iron Bridge where my map was wrong. I've since fixed it, but I first went in and I saw the railroad line, so I I drew my bridge over the railroad line. That's the wrong, that's the railroad line that was the old B and O is still there. The pensy has gone, and so it, it everything has moved up just a little bit. And I have fixed that in my in my maps, and so. I will, I'll come up with a way of figuring out how to send out those links. How does yeah. that sound? Okay. Yeah. And so that, I think that Andrew answers Andrew's question too, because he, is there a link for the, for the Google maps? And, 
Yeah, and if if uh, Dennis, if you are willing to share that, just let me know, um, and I can send it to individuals who may be interested too. So we don't have to like, you know, share it with someone. Had a question about all the gas stations. Uh, yes. I'm a yeah. There, there's still a lot of gas stations around Western Pennsylvania. It just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been one particular photo. I think it was early on in the program. Um, and then uh. Oh, Andrew Ladazzi also asked me who took the videos. Do you know who the who the videographer was for the 1951 films? Yes, I do, and his his name has slipped me. <laughs> I know I, you, I have... you mentioned they came from the PTM archives, right? Right, right. Uh, they were the they were the videos originally that Ben Rohrbeck put out. Uh, uh, Vince something. Oh, Seyfried. 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 Vince Seyfried. Seyfried. Yeah. Took, took the videos um, and I, I tried to cut them up as much as I could and got rid of, I, I tried to clean them up some, but they're just, they're really hard to clean up. Uh, yeah. I just got a new laptop. So I was, I was doing some experimenting and things like that. <laughs> yeah, lots of nice comments coming in. Um, another thing, like, I, I feel like I could have spent forever looking at the then and now photos, you know? Um, so did you basically, for this program, did you retrace the same route that you did in 2012? Is this like a thing you do like every 10 years or so? I went with Ed in 2012. Okay. Um, and I, I've gone on several different excursions with him over the years. And that was that was kind of my first experience of going out and doing a lot of it. So it was very, it's a learning experience because he, he always comes prepared. You know, he has maps, he has photographs. This is where this is, this is where that is. And that's what I try, that's, you know, we've tried to do in a lot of our publications of doing then and now. Uh, Chris Walker and I are actually throwing around an idea about a then and now project. But we we appreciate the support. It's it's fun to go out and look around. It, in the summer is not the best time. You know, when I went with Ed, it was in the winter time, but, uh, it's always fun. It's yeah. it's fun to see people's expressions when they ask why you're taking a photograph of their house and you pull out a photograph from the 1930s and say, this is why I'm taking a photograph of your house. I imagine most people don't even know that the trolley line was like in their backyard. A lot of people don't know. And then there are the other people that know every single tidbit. So it's 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 kind of fun. It's and you get to meet, you get to meet a lot of neat people. Uh, and it's it's special to me because my family's from that area. Uh, my grandparents lived in Hecla for eight eight to ten years. Uh, they lived in Calumet. They lived in Union. They lived in the West Bend Railway System most of their lives. Uh, I worked in the coke coke of coke industry for two summers in college, and so I understand exactly when I was talking about filth. I I. I mean, you learn to wash your eyelids. You have to learn to you have to learn to scrub your eyelids because it's just the coal dust gets everywhere. The smoke is unbelievable. It's just when they fire the ovens, it's it's and I can't imagine between Ligonier and Hecla was about eleven miles. You take a mile off of it, it was just Ligonier mm -hmm. the Trobe, and there were six thousand coke ovens. In ten miles, I can't no, begin to imagine. I can't begin to imagine the smoke. Go ahead, Ray. Look, he didn't have any lung damage. I uh, mean, uh, it took a while. I mean, I would go back to college, and it would be a couple months before I could cough and yeah. not have a lot of black. Mostly, most of the guys that worked our coal plants in the power industry, uh, and when the yeah. coal were, had bad lungs. Yeah, my dad, my, my dad had black lung. I'm sure my grandfather, my grandfather was a minor. My great grandfather was buried right outside of Trowger, and most of my family, a lot of my family, is buried there. So, uh, yeah, and it, and it, and now they're discovering too. There was just an article in our paper today dealing with the silica dust too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that are just destroying people's lungs. Yeah, yeah. The silica doesn't dissolve. No, I, 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 I've got uh, I've had lung problems for years. I was I went under the knife at 43 years old. 
Uh, we got a question in the chat from Philip Caricelli. No headlights on the cars. Did they do nighttime running? Yeah, and they put a headlight on. But Pennsylvania law did not require headlights back then. And so why spend, why, why use the money? You know, that was extra electricity. That was extra electricity. That was extra money. When you work in with these kind of people in this kind of a business, I, I imagine West Penn Railways to a certain extent was like the coal industry. You know, in the coal industry, if something broke down in the coke yard, everyone became a mechanic. Everyone was everyone went to work to fix the problem because you had to get production back up, and they had a make do attitude. I think West Penn to a great extent they were proud of what they did, but they were thrifty. They had to be. They had to be. They, you know, they were they were losing money after a, by the time they got into the forties. I mean, the the power the power plant money really helped them along. But it's just it's a tough business. So no headlights. No, no headlights during the day. A lot of, a lot of companies didn't do that. You know, that's why we have removable headlights. You look at all the early Pittsburgh railway cars, they don't have headlights. Along the, those lines, uh, a comment in the chat, if West Penn owned the power company and the trolley company, wasn't it just taking money from one pocket to another? Yeah, to a certain extent, but I, Ed does the financials. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you read our books and you see the portions about the financials ed usually does that i'm my interest for the most part is is the people the the one uh, you know what were these people's lives like um and remember people didn't people didn't ride people typically weren't going to go for a ride from greensburg to scottdale they were they weren't going to go from greensburg to uniontown they were going to go from one little town into maybe the bigger town. They weren't going to go from one coal patch to the next because you're going to go from one union supply company store to the next union supply company store that has the exact same products that the first one had. And so there's, there's no there's no benefit of that whatsoever. But you can go into town. Now, these company towns weren't like the bigger company towns later. These, these were bare bones places. You know, the bigger ones especially down in West Virginia and Kentucky. They had movie theaters. They had the whole nine yards. Uh, these were pretty basic. They had a school. You'd have a schoolhouse, and that was about it. Yeah. Company Kristen, store. Kristen, in answer to your question about the, the power company and the trolley company, basically the, they, they built the power plants to run the trolleys, and they sold off the excess power. That's how some of the towns had their power. Even even in Philadelphia, the, uh, in the old days, the uh, Philadelphia Transportation, well, but one of the predecessor companies had their own power plant at one time. And then, they, of course, it became, you know, later on when power plants were built, built and it wasn't possible and it wasn't, they didn't do that anymore. But if you look at public service of New Jersey was a perfect example of that. Uh, that in fact, that operation carried on into the bus days. <laughs> okay. So they finally got, got rid of them. Uh, and everybody should be able to unmute themselves if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. I'm not sure uh, I mentioned that, but if anyone's watching and would like to unmute themselves, just uh, it's usually on the bottom left of your screen if you'd like to unmute. Anybody? Um, Andrew, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, yeah, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, Actually, I just found something interesting that um, uh, Dennis might uh, look at since you were talking about to topographic maps that have the railroad rights of way on them. Uh, are you familiar with the historical download you can get from from uh, the U.S. Geological Survey? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because yes. interestingly enough, just while you guys were chatting, I went and looked. The 1950 something. No, it's a 19. It's an early 60s issue at one to 24. Uh, map of the area, and it actually shows the abandoned railroad going over the Pennsylvania uh, Turnpike. They actually drew right. it in on that map. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, se several of those, the, the West Penn appears on. The, the tough thing is a lot of times they don't always necessarily include trolley lines. No, I know. I'm just saying that in some but, cases. But I know, I know this because I've, I've seen the one you're talking about, and, and you're right. 
it's it's fascinating to see the amount of infrastructure that was there. You know, because it was the, we look at the late 19th and the early 20th centuries and the rise of, as someone put it, Queen Coke, or Princess, Prince Coke, Queen Coal, and King Steel. And the Pittsburgh area was, was the blast furnace for that, for the most part. A lot of it went went east to Bethlehem Steel too. A lot of a lot of that coal went there. There was a huge fight. That's why the B and O in Western Maryland, everyone was trying to get a piece of the pie that was there, and it was it was incredible for a while. Yes, they raped the land, destroyed the water, but a lot of it came back. It's 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 kind of it. Pennsylvania has done a very good job of trying to clean up waste disposal sites. All but right. it's an interesting okay. it's an interesting area it's an interesting area to go and visit. It's it's a lot of it is very beautiful. Uh I, I like I said I just can't imagine the smoke. The smoke and the filth and the dust. And all those white houses. <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah. Did the, well, thanks very much. Did the West Penn did their power company continue to use their right of way for the power lines and yes. can still follow it that way? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a lot of times if you go into Google Maps and you do the Earth view, especially this area, you can see the right of ways because it's it's cleared out. The power company still uses them. And mm -hmm. so they cut they cut all the trees. So it's it's actually pretty easy to follow in certain areas. And I'm still a customer. West Penn still exists. I'm still a customer of West Penn Power. That's where, that's who supplies my electricity. Uh, and uh, if anyone is interested in uh, tracing these rights of way, um, occasionally during a West Penn trolley meet at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we'll uh, do do a right of way exploration. We haven't done one in a long time, and we probably won't do one for the 2024 meet which is um, June 7th and 8th of 2024. Mark your calendars. Um, but occasionally we do these things. So uh, it's always fun to go hunting old rights of way. I know we've done a lot of the, like the Washington and Charleroi lines. I'm not sure if we've done like a big group West Penn outing. Do you remember, Dennis? Well, we, we went to, we were on a bus trip. We went over to uh, Connellsville and did did some of the some of that area. Ed, Ed showed us around some of the, and went to the went to the uh, former company shops, which West Penn Power still uses. Okay. And that was fascinating. That was absolutely fascinating doing that. Absolutely. Maybe we can do like a virtual one someday. We'll go. Uh, it's, it'll be like trolleyology on location. <laughs> uh, to, an to answer another question, um, the Public Utility Commission forced york railways to to go bust to get rid of the trolleys because they prohibited the power company which was owned by the same company from transferring funds to repair the tracks and the equipment of the street railway and i imagine west penn was in a similar situation like i said i'm i'm not terribly familiar with all of the financials they had enough money they knew by 1948 that they were going to close they just they just knew that there wasn't going to be enough money um i i think it was more just they gave up the ship i would have to go through and read the the puc rulings and i haven't i'll be perfectly honest i haven't uh or i could also talk to ed I mean, yeah, I spent uh, 31 years in the uh, in the utility business. Um, of course, I did fire protection for most of it, but uh, there was a lot of stuff that came down through the PUC and through FERC uh, on on you know uh, what you were subsidizing with with your uh, with your power company bills. So I, I don't doubt that at all that they that they uh, forced them out of the trolley business. I don't doubt that at all. Well, and they were all, West Penn was also in the water business too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember how to disconnect all the uh, 
we had these big signs, these big illumination illuminated signs. We had to disconnect them because the PUC came down and said that was a waste of power. And even the crown lights we had on the main office building, they had to shut them down for years. And there was a lot of stuff that came down. There was a lot of a lot of regulatory stuff uh, with, with the utilities. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments for Dennis before we wrap it up tonight? Okay. Well, hearing none, I want to thank Dennis again for putting this together. And I want to encourage Dennis to do more of these because I know you said you have uh, some other parts of the line that you may do in the future. So uh, I think this was very well received and we look forward <laughs> to maybe another one in the future, if that's all right with you. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but well, um, I, part, part of it is I have to be able to, I have to get to the archives and, you know, a lot of those things, they're not set up to do scanning or anything like that yet. You know, and I've been working with Chris, but there's to, to be able to, do, I have enough to get to get the Trafford, but to get into McKeesport, that's that's gonna require some, some digging. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, we'll come back next year, maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. And thank to, thanks to those of you who joined us tonight, especially to those of you who made a donation. Again, if you have an idea for a trolleyology presentation, whether it's about Pennsylvania or transit in general, please let me know. Um, my email that I'm using now is kfred at patrolley.org. Um, if you email the old one, it'll still work, but um, my email now is kfred at patrolley.org. I hope you guys can join us again in the coming weeks or in person, maybe during the Washington County Fair. Thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.